extremely important. We have the same challenges in terms of different tests with different accuracies being used in any EHR. You will find that. And so there is not much one can do except for trying to validate findings from other information content in the EHR, right? So if maybe a test is just a marker, but then there are other information, treatment, medical claims through which you can try to validate. We also do always do when we are publishing a paper on a phenotype that you do not understand very well to do actually the you know file review of that patient by an actual clinician for a subsample to understand to create sort of a gold standard that this is what the EHR sort of phenotype is saying what a physician is saying. Of course, we cannot do it large scale for our 100,000 yeah. patients, but for some we do for a sanity check because this is extremely important and that's where the clinical information has to be woven into the technical and the modeling information. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you. Because this was my question when we did in small subset of population for like acute kidney injury. So we uh, we uh, selected the population and uh, around 5000. But when clinically validated, 2000 is even a big challenge. Like it took us uh, like long hours of uh, seeing each and every patient file. So that's uh, really I felt the challenges. Uh, yeah, so so what you can do, what we often do is to incorporate that phenotyping error that we find by comparing that subset into our final inference. So our confidence in the estimate goes down and the confidence intervals become wider and the odds ratios become a little attenuated because we are not as confident. We assume that there is a measurement error in the phenotyping. So we can articulate those errors by doing the kind of validation study that you are talking about. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, for uh, a very engaging talk. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you on behalf of IIT Bombay and the RB Memorial Conference organizers uh, for this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening, everyone. So in the uh, this session, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Nitish Thakur. Uh, and I understand the students have uh, an introductory video. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Thakur, if you can stop sharing the screen for a moment. I don't students. have any screen access at all, so I, I'm not sharing anything. I don't have screen access. Okay. Uh, I'm just audience at the moment. All right. Maybe so I'll let do. students play the uh, play the video if they can. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to welcome Professor Nadesh Thakur, who will join us from Johns Hopkins University. Professor Nadesh Thakur has a PhD in electrical 
and computer engineering from University of Wisconsin. His research interests are medical instrumentation, neuroengineering, neural signal processing, and clinical instrumentation, micro nanoscale sensors, devices, and systems. He is currently the editor in chief of medical and biological engineering and computing and was the EIC of IEE Transactions on Neural Systems and Rehabilitation Engineering from 2005 to 2011. He is a recipient of the Award of Technical Excellence in Neuroengineering from IEE Engineering in Medicine and Biological Society and Distinguished Alumnus Award from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, India. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Nadish Thakur. Thank you. So uh, we will uh, so the uh, organizers, do you know how to uh, allow Professor Thakur to share his screen? Uh, can I do my I, own presentation? I, I think, uh, I think, uh, please, I but think we are just... I, I know I've already given him permissions. I think Professor Thakur I, can I don't see it on my screen, unfortunately. Um, oh. Uh, just, which will prevent uh, me from playing some videos. Uh, may I just for one minute log out and uh, log in? Maybe uh, looks like I've gone to uh, 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 view more. Uh, let me try once more, Professor Thakur, if you don't mind. I, uh, I think we should be able to do that now. Can you try, please? I, I, I don't, there is no speaker view here. Uh, I, I'm a, like a participant, so I have no button that says make a presentation or anything. Uh, Maybe the one who is uh, already presenting has to stop presenting. Somebody is presenting the. So you are an attendee, so that's what it says. You are an attendee, you won't be able to share uh, uh, content or facilitate. So I am on an attendee mode. Let me log out and log in again to the link. I, I, I was. I this is Prasad here. I've changed you to presenter. OK, but I. Uh, I st uh, it's. Dismiss. I still am a uh, attendee, uh, so I I don't know what there is no I my buttons are video mute, open share tray. I is that what it is? Share, then uh, share content. Then I was, one next no. to Mike. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, yes, one next to screen. Mike. Uh, yes, we can see your screen. You yes, you see my screen, screen really? Yes. Okay, yes, I see your screen. It. Unfortunately, it's strange. Okay, hang on. Just so let me see if my presentation shows up. Do you see my presentation? Not yet. Uh, so so there you go. So I don't know what it's showing. Uh, I was hoping we would have a trial run. I didn't get a time window to do that. Okay, I I'm at a loss. So I I'm thinking. Let me. So Professor Nitish, we, I mean, we, your, your time has actually is not started, so we have time. So um, let me let me, either you fix it or I fix it by logging out and logging in again, and I might get a different uh, mode. Okay, so I'm going to log out and I'll log in again. I think since you are not able to fix it from your side. again um, I will see um, do I go to open share tray it says only meeting organizers yes. and presenta presenters can share so do I do you see anything uh, you see a blank screen like before I'm not clear why exactly so I uh, you know I do. I have no idea what to do here. So we can then we will miss the video, and we can just, in the interest of time, get on with the slideshow I've sent, uh, which I'm fortunate that I did. It's unfortunate some of the videos were more useful. Uh, is it okay if I play your video? I have your PPT. I can. No, no, no. That one doesn't have it. These were videos from uh, internet, just to make a point. But uh, let's just go ahead because uh, you, I, I don't have a presenter mode. Uh, 
That's all can I you can try one spoon? Can you try one spoon? I don't. You see, what I have is camera off, mute, and stop sharing. But I don't see any share. Uh, that's the thing, you know. And then more actions and all those things. So um, oh. I go to full screen. Um, yep, it's still, you know, like Zoom or anything. Normally, I should be getting a, a my own presentation, which is on the desktop and open right now. So okay. if I stop sharing, then I don't know what I see. I, do, I see all your uh, um, names, initials. I don't see anything else. Oh. It's, At the uh, moment, I heard all the presentations and all of that, but uh, I, I don't hear, uh, I don't see anything, any of you other than initials. And I've done Zoom before, so I don't know what's the with the setting. So why don't you just make put up my presentation and we'll just go with it. It's, uh, it's a little unfortunate, but that's how it happens sometimes. Really sorry for this. Uh, um, Abhilash, please present slides. Okay. It would be in future a good idea to give the speakers a trial run to debug it before uh, the events. Generally, I'm used to it and Zoom works much better than other options. OK, so now I sort of at least see myself <laughs> and something. Uh, yes, OK, good. Um, so yeah, go into presentation mode if you don't mind. All right, well, so uh, good evening to you all and thank you for inviting me. I, you know, uh, it's all of it is because of my association with IIT Bombay, right? So I continue to be very motivated and supportive of any activities going on on campus. And I kind of play that role in some departments or quite a center, of course, and then um, an IIT Bombay Heritage Front from the US side. So it's a privilege and I want to thank you all for that. So can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, and of course, this is important. Uh, you know, it's it's an incredible privilege for ID Bombay that um, the KCDH has been set up just the right thing at the right time. You know, priorities change, and this is a perfect timing in the era of digital health and global health uh, problems. And, you know, seeing all the proposals and presentations even early morning, uh, you know, IIT Bombay is very, beautifully positioned, so it's uh, it's going to be exciting years ahead. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Abhilash. Abhilash, can you move to the next slide? Yeah, please, you know, you'll, you'll need to move the slides, otherwise this will. Okay. Yeah, so please, okay. you lost the slides now. Professor Mithish, have you logged in from your browser? Okay. I attended early morning session. I attended Professor Brahmar's presentation. Uh, please go back. Uh, you are completely mixing up the slides. Go to slide number four, please. It would have been three, but irrespective. You, please go into three, three. You're going to five. You're going in the wrong direction. OK, yeah, you know, I just want to give a little bit of background. Uh, I don't know if their audience has students or not. Uh, so today, I, the interesting and important thing is that how the journey starts, right? I mean, I was a student, like if there are students in the audience doing something, but my BTEC project in way back in 74, before something biomedical was ever even cool on the campus. And you know, one thing led to another, and actually, my I reached out to an advisor in University of Wisconsin, whose paper I read in the library on which I built my BTEC project, which led to PhD and so on and so forth. And so, over the years, uh, my own life and career has evolved quite a bit different from the times that I was a student. So I hope that all of you probably share that that life moves on, new ideas, new problems arise. So, you know, this is the uh, KCDH and what it's doing is the right thing to do at this time. And uh, I wish I was a young student again to join.
but let's go to the next slide. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so this is about uh, Professor Inti Banerjee, and it's, I was really shocked and surprised uh, that she passed away. I just found out uh, through this symposium. So, you know, I just found this quote from her um, that uh, is quite appropriate for uh, the symposium here, uh, that we continue to do science and innovation, and all the talks we heard are about healthcare. In fact, Dr. Brahmar just, in fact, indeed mentioned something about inclusive healthcare and people who are left out. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, you know, so I want to make slightly different point, and of course, I want to make sure that I give. Uh, this is about uh, since mine is the last talk, I don't want to. Uh, I want to address different topics. So this is uh, Dr. Banerjee's credentials that we seen, tend to see when we look at academics. With this kind of credentials at her age, she would be full professor at almost any uh, top U.S. university. You know, looking at the citations and H index, which is, you know, 40 papers with 40 plus citations. And what is also remarkable is the growth curve of her citations, which means she was essentially at the peak of her career, you know, which is um, quite impressive. Uh, her Specialities you see is biomaterials, nanomedicine, and point of care diagnostics and such. And I think she was starting to help with uh, digital health and so on. So I, I think I'll kind of address those things through her own work. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, one of the ways that I hope the Koita Center faculty also pay attention and interest as academics, and then uh, unfortunately my videos won't be there as translators. So there are two things that I wanted to touch. And you know, one, one among the things you live as an academics is your publications, your citation, and you can see that Dr. Banerjee, even in the recent years, in the last decade, has a number of highly cited papers. Uh, it's quite amazing to see such numbers in such a short time. And in variety of important journals, right? Drug delivery to biomaterials and so on. And so I hope that again, the KCDH faculty will make both clinical and social impact, but also academic impact along these lines. Uh, next slide, please. So I just took some example to kind of enlighten. And I mean, I'm generally familiar with a lot of the topics, although it's not relevant to this conference. But here is one of the very highly cited paper is about using biopolymers and hydrogels for cartilage tissue engineering. You know, cartilages are avascular, and so some kind of, you know, they degenerate with aging even worse and other diseases. And uh, these kind of biomaterials, hydrogels and so on, can serve as a way to treat the cartilage degeneration. And, you know, you see a little injecting inject you know injection device which means you can even inject such gels including maybe stem cells so rather interesting and important work in the field of tissue engineering uh, next slide please this is uh, one of our papers about temperature target uh, sensitive magnetic liposomes for thermochemotherapy and here is one of the uh, another again very impressive thing is the longevity of this work over the many more than a decade. You know some of the today citation index look at only last couple of years and which works for hot areas, but longevity is also important. It's something I hope the work done. Some of the particularly the mathematicians, statistician, computer scientists. You know you don't get cited right away. <laughs> uh, it's abstract, difficult material, but longevity proves your. Uh, expertise. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Banerjee also worked in the area of nanotechnology, the interface of medicine, tumor, and nanotechnology, so that, you know, the whole problem with tumors uh, is to target to the cells. And how do you do the targeting? And so most emergent approaches now use some form or shape of nanotechnology, nanoparticles, biodegradable materials to get into the tumor, and they have to solve a number of problems. Unfortunately, I can't use the cursor, so you'll have to kind of view it that, you know, on the left side, you have to get it through blood vessels. On the right side, 
maybe use magnetic fields to push those kind of magnetically sensitive particles in there. And then there are a number of other ways to actually kill the tumor cells. OK, so next slide, please. I just wanted to give a uh, introduction on this, but again, you see that Dr. Banerjee has a number of papers, quite a few, on the nanoparticle uh, for wound healing or tumor and glioblastoma and so on that I will discuss, and then later on some variable and implantable. But these are, what is remarkable is that these are 2022 papers. So that means her legacy is even continuing right now, which I find it astonishing and impressive. Uh, just these are the eight uh, refereed papers that I have found uh, just through a short review. So amazing. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so now kind of getting in the talk and since we're moving a bit slowly, I'll skip some things later on. But like now what you are now seeing is that the past or Dr. Banerjee's work, and I know a lot of that also has gone on at all institution. Nanotechnology was hot. Tissue engineering was really hot, and now it's digital health, right? I mean, science moves, heart fills emerge. And I'm going to make a case study out of glioblastoma. It's a lethal brain cancer to see if we can bring it all together. OK, so next slide. And as I said, I may have to skip some things because we are moving too slowly in the slide shifts. Next slide, please. OK, so part one is nanotechnology, and I see that Dr. Banerjee had a paper, it's a biomaterials, it's a very well-recognized journal about variable and implantable devices for drug delivery application and challenges. So, you know, delivering drugs um, and that too using biomaterials has been an explosive field, and uh, throughout the U.S. and major institution, you'll see bioengineering departments full of researchers working on this area. Uh, next slide, please. So representing what Dr. Banerjee did and uh, generally the field, it's about things like drug eluting lens on the upper left-hand corner, lately become very popular, which may apply someday, who knows, for a certain type of uh, cancers and vaccines and such is micro needle patches, which you see in the bottom. So that this is now way that glucose testing is being done. Um, drug eluting stent on the upper right uh, upper on the right side has become very much a commercial clinical business for uh, you know stents for the heart uh, next slide next slide please yeah so here again going back to dr banerjee then oh can you go back please yes so you know she worked in the area of wound healing so you can see that wounds uh, have to be treated and again, delivering uh, stem cells, nanoparticles, enteromarkerial drugs, all of that is important. And on the right side, the review kind of captures a lot of buzzwords, but these are cutting edge materials that uh, can be used for a variety of uh, tissue engineering problems, including wound healing. And wound healing and geogenesis, which is blood vessel formation, is very similar to what happens in cancer, which we'll talk about. OK, next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. OK, so I'm off topic in a digital health community, but hey, you get to know something new today. <laughs> and so everybody sort of heard of nanotechnology buzzword. These are like three or four amazing cutting edge things, carbon nanotubes and graphene. You know, this is sort of like Nobel Prize living work because carbon um, in graphene and energy form is in you know, a monolayer. So it's it has now finding profound application. Uh, quantum dots and gold nanoparticles are potentially a way to image or colorize. So now start thinking about cancer glioblastoma that we're going to talk about that these things can be used for coloring the cancer or the treatment. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, the question is why nanoscale? And again, today, of course, we are all thinking of COVID and COVID vaccines and so on. And I wouldn't be surprised that some biodegradable formulations will come out. One of the pioneering uh, Moderna company is co-founded by Dr. Robert Langer, who is world famous, and he's famous for biodegradable delivery. And so, sorry. OK, so Dr. Uh, you know, this biodegradable delivery um, 
of vaccine, who knows? Uh, but any case, uh, uh, it's an option to studies, but uh, you know, by you know, drugs and disease and treatment and scale matters. Uh, so you see the pictorial representation. A lot of things that causes health problems are tiny, nano scale to micro scale. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there is a scale in the nervous system, which is a bit my field. Uh, I, I'm going to actually skip all of my work because of lack of time. But, you know, in the brain, how do you get? And again, focus will be glioblastoma and then the use of AI and digital health. So you have to understand a little bit about neuroscience. Uh, you know, so the domain knowledge, even though you may be involved in digital health, is important and scale here is synapse, which you see in the middle, neurons and synapse and ion channels. And the, the challenge is to getting the drug or the treatment to those in a vast 80 billion brain cells that we all have. And so nervous system interfacing to nanoscale is another challenge. We'll leave it for some other day. Uh, next slide. Next, please. Yes. Uh, nanoscale, this is this is what I look back to my IIT days, and I feel like the fundas, as we used to call them, I got, I, I use them, right? Because these solutions are optical, magnetic, electrical, topographic is mechanical. Look at, I mean, I was electrical engineering, doesn't matter. I, in my own way, have used each of these physical, chemical modalities and associated either engineering or mathematics. And so, this is comes together sooner or later if we have good fundas. I just hope, uh, you know, I'm sure all scientists recognize that. Um, math and statistics at the top of the pyramid, I would say. But OK, next slide. Uh, and so in my work, in my field, uh, this type of thing is neurotechnologies have now become very prevalent. Each one of them is a commercial and clinical solution, and I Hope I have time to say how to make a clinical impact. But every one of these machines you may have heard of and seen in some other ways, some like magnetic resonance imaging on the right, obviously, and other things like artificial vision is become reality, FDA has approved, and uh, my work on artificial limb and sensors is happening as we speak through startups and such. Okay, next slide, please. Next. Next slide, please. Okay, I think I'm going to have to start skipping the slide. So please, whoever is moving the slide, can you be attentive because we will be here forever. Uh, so let's, we'll just have to skip uh, some of the topics, uh, the kind of work that, uh, on uh, neuro nanotechnology that I work on. I'll, can you skip it? Let's just skip this. Skip them, skip this. Next, next, next. Next, please. Next. Next. OK, next. So I think one, I, I, I want, oh, oh, <laughs> OK, that's fine. Previous slide, you might have seen it. But you know, I want to make a transition to one disease problem and then uh, transition to digital health and how to make an impact. And so here is the nanoparticle nanotechnology said, we did tell you about gold nanorods. They can be delivered to a tumor to somehow heat it up or deliver the drug. OK, so next slide. So let's, since Dr. Banerjee did work on tumor and glioblastoma, and I know something about it, it's, um, I thought I can elaborate. Glioblastoma is one of the most lethal cells. When you get a diagnosis, you have about six months to live. And through these kind of nanotechnology to other uh, topics, it's now life expectancy after such diagnosis might be uh, about a year and a half. So it is it is the most lethal diagnosis you can get in among many. OK, so next slide. And here I wanted to point out Nanoscale is an important journal uh, and it's a 2022 paper. So I think either, you know, it's just come out, I would say. And Dr. Banerjee worked on this intranasal route to delivering because the, the problem is how do you get anything to the brain through the blood-brain barrier? And if you can go through nasal mucosa, 
into the brain. I mean, wouldn't that be incredible? And this is a mouse study. Uh, we are not going to go into any data today just to appreciate high quality work and how it can make an impact. Of course, going into clinical will take a long time, but but here is some pioneering work just very recent. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So for those of you who don't know anything, it's a you know, why clinical motivation. And I was pleased to see in the morning that everybody started with the clinical motivation. So here is a brain tumor. It's very aggressive. Uh, next slide. And you know, uh, the therapies are surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, as I said, today at best 12 to 15 percent month survival. Uh, next slide. And sorry about the you know pictures like this, uh, but this is what a surgeon sees and they resect the tumor. And uh, how do you know where the tumor ends and a healthy brain is? And if you take out too much tumor, you lose the brain. And if you don't, then you have residual tumor cells, which will come back. This is what generally happens. And lighting it up by different methods, optical and others. And then uh, for digital health people, I'm going to make a case about digital biopsy. Maybe a way to go. Next slide. Next. Yeah. So, you know, this is, uh, we'll go through a bit rapidly because of the time. But there are now, these are optical images that can show you in tumor in a vivid manner that it's uh, that is after skull removal. These are our rodent type studies. But so you can look at tumor, blood vessels. Tumor likes blood vessels. You know, it needs to grow. Eventually, then it kills uh, the tissue. So optical techniques that look at blood vessel oxygen is very important. Uh, next slide. And studies like this are done initially in mouse and rodent study. I'll skip it. Next slide. And you can see that if you do some treatments, such as with laser and nanoparticle, this little gray stuff you see is tumor, and it is reduced. And of course, the challenge is how do you go from rodent study to human studies, which is a lot of the clinicians today would want to know, right? And that's the challenge of academics. So this is what I'm trying to use as an example of what challenges we're going to face is from basic study to how to translate in a realistic time manner. Next slide. Uh, uh, so there are, again, a variety of ways to look at the brain and tumor using uh, optical and uh, looking at oxygenation in the brain and blood vessels in the brain. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then the, the the key challenge a surgeon would face is where is the tumor and where is the healthy tissue? Like, is that a dotted line? And why am I even presenting it to this digital health community? Because I think that there's a, some degree of evolution and consensus that we'll need some kind of digital biopsies using AI, machine intelligence method to do this classification. Um, the biology and materials has only gone so far. So next slide, please. Yeah, and so this would be an image guided surgery. You can see there is a tumor and you can see it's uh, gradually diminished. On the right side, you see that there are different types of nanoparticles and laser techniques do prolong uh, life. Now in this case of a rodent, but hopefully it will apply to patients. So elongate the lifespan. That's what we all want, right? Uh, next slide. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so here we are, state of the art. Um, MRI, fluorescence, like colorizing the cells, intraoperative, during the operation, even, and what is the future? It could be intraoperative imaging and AI, digital health, to do all this in real time in a classifier based on some of the prior knowledge. Uh, next slide. Next. Yeah, <clears throat> and you know, this is one of our studies done in a rodent, but you know, you can see this little, just follow the little red circles that, you know, good microscopy, good imaging, you can see this evolution of a tumor's lifetime in a rat over 15 days. The trick to treating tumors is early detection. Is that in the number one or two dot, the beginning of a tumor? Can machine intelligence pick it up? Uh, somewhere in the middle, it's really bright because it's there's a lot of blood vessel and oxygen that tumor has hogged. 
is is that a region that we should surgically resect or towards the end did we get everything out or did it spread and so on so imaging has done its part nanoparticles and things have done their part but we don't have the intelligence to deal with this so Unlike your large digital health problem, this is wonderfully constrained problem with animal model and a clinical model and life issues. And I hope somebody will pick it up as a digital health problem. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is where unfortunately my videos are would have been very useful. Uh, this is a picture of Johns Hopkins Hospital, but the two people involved are Robert Langer on the left and Henry Brehm, a neurosurgeon on the right. And they're both world famous. Um, and uh, Dr. Langer for his biomaterials, biodegradable materials, probably the most cited engineer, if not a scientist in the world. And Henry Bram is world renowned neurosurgeon who, who made the first treatment of glioma happen. So I think today what I saw and what's happening in KCDH, this partnership, I wanted to show this and their video because that would show how physicians and engineers and nowadays computer scientists and mathematicians and statisticians could work together and they made an impact which is really what we want to be able to achieve right uh, so i started with talking about impact in terms of publication now i want to talk about impact in terms of treatment human outcome and it's it's not great um, you know six months to a year and a half so in fact this is challenge and work continues uh, next slide Okay, so uh, sorry, it's, uh, there are no videos, but now we're going to transition. And so where does digital health come in? Next slide. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so here it is. I just took glioma, right? This is that lethal brain cancer. And look at what's happening in the publications count. And it's just, it's exploding, right? You know, as I have shown, you know, we might have started with biomaterials, then all the nanoparticle, then all the imaging, and now these imaging combined with AI to localize where the tumors are and how to resect. And I would say that if we go further, it will be things like digital biopsy might be the future. And this is what I hope KCDH faculty would aspire for, right? To see they're part of this change, the pioneering change. Uh, next slide. I think it's not point, this is not the point to give a tutorial on AI. There are the buzzwords about AI and machine learning and neural network and everybody's favorite deep learning, but this is getting, I mean, it's, it's working. You know, I saw one presentation about retinal images, but everywhere. So there are great deep nuances of these techniques now that are coming forward. So of course we may all need to collaborate to make this work. Uh, next slide. And if you, do want to do one second, uh, one slide tutorial on uh, deep learning or convolutional networks? You know, you're going to start with these brain tumors. You know, the left side, and you know, again, I saw the talk about you know talks where you have limited data. But there aren't millions or thousands even of brain tumor um, patients or images, and so the, developing these techniques from sparse data and heterogeneity is going to be very important. So I was really delighted to hear some of the techniques that I came out in some of the proposals and presentation that it's going to be needed. It's going to be need, we'll need new form of deep learning, machine learning. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here, I mean, is that a smart way of segmenting tumor? Is there a guidance to give to a surgeon where to cut it? And we have seen another video that I had wanted to show was about mammography and very recent results. I don't know whether it's from Google, but somewhere that, yep, radiologists could not pick it up from mammography and that AI machine intelligence in some form did a great job. And this was a scientist who, who worked in AI and she, it was her own breasts that were, she went back to old images to new and that's what happened, right? So this is a astonishing, example of how machine learning and AI could be helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So what may well be this kind of future workflow, right? We could get these MRI, some of you are working on vaccines, others are working on other public health issues. Then you're gonna start working with IIT faculty who are doing segmentation and deep learning and all those things. 
and they're going to keep working. The students will go deep into this data and this they're going to do feature extraction and so on. We saw and heard in the talks that there is a lot of other data that I, I've just emphasized image for focus, but age, gender, clinical, genetics, all of that. Then we again, we, I heard the talks about and asked the question about predictive models because you know that's going to be really important. And you know, on the right side, there are some biomarkers, genetics and molecular. And finally, the goal is to achieve prognosis. So I, I would say this will be the future workflow. And increasingly, it's going to go from traditional to more futuristic, computational, and data intensive. Uh, next slide. Yeah, it's a little bit more of the same. It's a egg. So this is the point I have been making that AI guided treatment, like a virtual biopsy, right? You get these images, maybe you have prior knowledge, and you have all kind of other information about genetics and patient information and so on. And then you do AI virtual biopsy to understand what, where to cut, what to treat, and then predictive outcome. So this would be a potentially a model for these kind of rare but lethal diseases, uh, somewhat different than vast uh, epidemiology problems that we heard about. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and I hope therefore you see these challenges and role, and I, you can substitute glioblastoma with something else if you like, but since I'm the last person wrapping up, we heard about limited data and annotation. It's so remarkable that I had this slide sitting there and I heard a talk about that as a problem. Model training, which writes all of this from large data set to small, and then we are, what has been most impressive for me and happy to hear how your faculty have reached out to the physicians in Mumbai, but also elsewhere to create this consortia so that they can create this standardization, benchmarking, uh, and annotations, and then eventual interpretation and treatment. So I think they, these are all three equal challenges. I looking ahead. Uh, next slide. So uh, hit the return next one, uh, you know, just con it'll continue, add some text. So, you know, today I gave you, I started with nanotechnology, you know, maybe it was off topic, but I hope now you see it all come together that, you know, this whole thing about blood brain uh, barriers, targeting glioma cells, nanoparticles, nanotechnology, and I wouldn't be surprised there are people doing that in bioengineering and elsewhere. And now you are the new community who is into AI and digital health. So you could go into tumor margin detection, understanding angiogenesis, uh, and then develop image-guided virtual biopsies. And your challenge is what we saw in the last slide, data, models, algorithms, and clinical deployment. So perhaps my talk kind of pulls it together for you that cutting edge technology, because IIT is an engineering institution which is transitioning into broader topics, there is a lot of expertise along those lines and emerging and modern uh, computer science, AI, statistics, math, people teaming up might is obviously the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, so we want a video. Uh, so I, I want to end this again in appreciation of Dr. Banerjee's work, which was inspirational. The more I studied, it seemed like, uh, you know, how impressive and makes me proud that IIT is producing faculty and students who are of that world-class caliber. You know, some of the industry folks get a lot of publicity, but academics are <laughs> that you know what made the institution. And of course, quite a center and its resources, and now the benefit of new grants that are going to initiate a number of wonderful projects. Uh, I think I'm concluding. Maybe the last slide. Um, Next, please. Yeah, so OK, so thank you. Uh, maybe I believe this is it. So if you could uh, turn the screen off and hopefully I we have a little bit of time left for uh, discussion or uh, on any topic. So turn the slide off, please. Yeah, turn that off so we can see each other. Yeah, OK, well, uh, OK, looks like, yeah. So I, it's a privilege to be here and I'm delighted that things have taken off so well. Uh, sorry about, uh, well, it's unfortunate these problems, but I'm sure all of you have given such talks and have had these nuisance occur all the time. So that's part of the problem. So, okay, I'll be happy to take questions and 
maybe just have a discussion about how to make KCDH and other things work. And I get just last one sentence that I want to reinforce that I hope as we started, we talked about academic scholarship, right? The impact, citation, publication, of course, edge students that we produce. And then we ended up with impact on the health, right? Outcomes, delivery and outcomes. So I hope that we, we will make progress on both fronts. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Uh, I think Ganesh has a question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nidish Thakur. Uh, your, I mean, your talk is inspirational and also uh, mentoring. And, uh, I think we're going to revisit several points you made through the talk. Uh, one question, have you, you, thanks for bringing up that uh, uh, gladial way, for example, right? I mean, the importance of collaboration, um, uh, uh, collaboration by design rather than in retrospect, right? I think that's very important. So I have. Uh, I just want to add one more pot potential partner to the collaboration. You talked about, you know, uh, uh, researchers uh, in the uh, engineering discipline and then medical practitioners. Um, I, I feel there's also need to get the hardware manufacturers in here. You, for example, when, when you talk about photoacoustic imaging, right? DICOM has evolved as a standard for images. Um, However, when it comes to DICOM for path, oh, sorry, uh, standards or, uh, or for ingestion for path data, or in general, many new devices keep getting manufactured, new biomarkers come up. And then uh, the entire process of ingesting the data becomes an another area of <laughs> uh, research or whatever, right? So there's too much of additional overhead that gets carried on if this, these are not thought out upfront. So isn't there a need? Is there an effort for creating such a consortium between hardware manufacturers, medical device manufacturers, uh, and medical practitioners, and statisticians, uh, data analysts? Um, has there been any such initiative anywhere? Uh, yeah, no, it's indeed an important point. And I, considering the audience, I didn't go into technology and, in fact, cut it out. The biggest problem, I remember my very early days trying to get the, any kind of brain data, and the companies would not, it's all proprietary and it's a black box. So you can't get the data out from them. And they treat it so much as a proprietary. So that's actually the biggest killer. And therefore, some kind of a confidentiality agreement. So, you know, we have very sensitive issues. Some of you have touched on patient record. Dr. Brahma mentioned about it, uh, 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 removing patient identifier. Others have trouble with patient record, which is a highly publicized. And now you bring up the issue of the hardware manufacturers, the MRI people, or whatever it is. How do you get data out of them without? Uh, confidentiality and so on. I think it's these along with regulatory are more intractable than almost anything else we can do. These are humans with selfish motivation. Sorry to put, use that word. Uh, perhaps the scenario, thankfully, thankfully because of innovation, there may well be an amazing startup coming out of Sign who is building a technology which then is emerging and your partner in that. And I, I see those consortia as valid. Although once in a while, the big companies um, have found occasionally big in institutional partner of repute. So ap Applied Materials has partnered with IIT Bombay in uh, IC chip electron or design and all of that. So if you create this center of excellence where, like where else would you go? That's why I'm excited about KCDH and the initiative that you become the go-to place because India is going to have the data and all those, so the patients, population. So would the manufacturer see the necessity to open up their little black box so that you can either access the machine because they can be very expensive so that you get some discounted access or access to the data? I think that, I think the answer is still very rapidly become India class, if not world class, so that the manufacturers come to you. Thanks, that was very helpful, Dr. Nitesh. Uh, Dr. Prasad has a question. Oh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you, uh, uh, Professor Nitesh Thakur, for a wonderful talk, as well as uh, I wanted to personally thank you for uh, talking about Rinti Am Rinti's husband. So thank you very much. Dr. Nitesh, I also want to thank you for talking about the data efficient learning. I'll probably send out a separate email on that since I spoke about it. I'm very excited. Uh, that that we have struck a chord there. Yeah. Well, you know, we all have 
our own speciality problem and we are not able to look out of that tunnel. But and other is our own expertise, right? In all um, humility, we can't pretend we know about everything. I work on, it's amazing, maybe it's later in my life, so these problems attract me. It's like coma and consciousness, right? So we do these studies in animal, we have patient data. How many patients am I gonna study whose brain waves I can analyze to predict whether this person is gonna be in permanent coma, is gonna die, or is gonna wake up? And it's all I have is brain signature, a lot of heterogeneous data. Same thing with glioblastoma, same thing. So there is a high volume, high epidemiology diseases like COVID and TB and all of those, same malaria and such. And there are these low volume, high morbidity, mortality problems too. And I, I would say that what I see as an editor is this blind en ma masse publication that use popular toolbox of deep learning methods to a standard database of this or that or that and say, I got 85, 90% accuracy all the time in and I triage all of them. As opposed to these unique problems like that, that we heard some of them today, I don't want to repeat, but limited data, sparse, uh, heterogeneity. Uh, in my case, like looking at brain waves, I mean, do we have like, I mean, we know there is something there, a signature of arousal, which is a safer word to use than consciousness. But you may you may know somebody who is in an intensive care unit and the doctor makes a final decision to remove the life support. Are they doing the right thing or not, right? I mean, you can see that things that are life and death as COVID and things are life and death as one of the problems that I'm working on. And I think this is where this uh, abstract value of machine learning. But what I want to say for you uh, is, Ganesh, that do what you do best, right? Because you have that computational, mathematical, some of your statistician, but find that problem. And what I don't want to see is a bandwagon effect of vast data, heterogeneous, messy data with low impact papers that uh, sort of like gets lost in the crowd. I would also like to see, I hope that after these 10 uh, recognition award, like one or two superstars, one or two amazing projects will receive uh, national funding because this is just a seed, right? And uh, that, uh, or international in some cases, welcome trust and others, so that it scales up. And then going back to the question, then you can get huge computing resources or, or industry to join in and so on. You know, it's very easy as scientists in these talks to get caught up in our own work and all the data and so on. And there is there are conferences and meetings for that to your specialty community. Perhaps such forums are should address the cross-cutting topics of uh, you know some of the things that I mentioned. So I hope I was somewhat targeting at the very end of a long day that you guys had uh, on something beyond. And of course, uh, pay some respect to Dr. Banerjee. So I have uh, one question. Uh, I don't see any other uh, hands raised. So, and this, uh, this is sort of a philosophical question uh, about uh, data and knowledge. Uh, and I sort of had this question also for the previous speaker. Uh, I didn't ask in the interest of time. So you have a lot of data and uh, the domain expert has the knowledge. And in addition to uh, the data mining tools that uh, or the statistical uh, data analysis tools, the expert can look at the data and glean some knowledge right away. Uh, so, you know, the knowledge, the prior knowledge that the expert has, the knowledge that the expert can glean, and the patterns that the data scientists can extract. How do you marry these things? It's an amazing question. I'll just say one sentence and then I'll defer to Dr. Brahma and uh, Ganesh and the rest of you. The reason is that I think it's, you know, it's it's the brain, right? We have what is incredible prior genetic, neuroscience, cognitive, one shot learning. You know, there are all these learning models. So obviously that's what who we are and our machines don't have that. So maybe there is some kind of a job for a neuroengineer like me in the future, but I won't be I'm not the data person, and therefore, uh, if Dr. Brahma is still there, maybe she can speak, or Ganesh or anybody else can talk to that. It's an important question, right? How does a doctor, experienced doctor, you go to them, they give you a diagnosis, right? Experienced GP, family practitioner, and the experts, 
look through niche and tunnel, you know, and say, oh, I have a pain in my left side of my chest, and they think, cardiologists think heart attack, and you might just have a pulled muscle, right? So I think that, that I don't know, if some, I would rather somebody else give that answer uh, and have a dialogue or discussion. Uh, yes, just a very short answer. I think for a long time, this has been studied in the uh, uh, in the knowledge systems, expert systems area in AI, artificial intelligence, encoding human domain knowledge. Uh, what has not been, what yet needs to be significantly explored is how that can work with statistical models. Uh, the handshake is is probably the challenge because what happens is typically one overwhelms the other. The either the expert system, the rules, the first order logic, the theorem prover over, overwhelms the statistical inference model or the other way. So uh, finding the right balance, I think is still a big challenge. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I'm going to use my um, uh, my privileges uh, as the moderator to ask one more question. And since you are on the advisory board and th there's a wider audience here uh, and I would like to hear your views. So what's the role of the hardware in this? Because we certainly, uh, you know, are a little bit behind as a country in this domain. The latest hardware uh, in the biomedical engineering, even the smaller devices, the, the, you know, the expensive devices and so on. The hardware and the expertise to use this hardware, uh, use and also maintain. So how important would that be in the kind of research that KCDH would like to undertake? Yeah, you know, we can always see these things as glass half full, half empty, right? We all have our um, challenges and certain benefits, right? Like going back data, India has millions, America has messy, non-documented, heterogeneous patient record. India arguably is way ahead in mobile phone than US, right? So, you know, it's somehow when a country puts its priorities together, certain ecosystem works. Yeah, so I think, for example, getting a private MRI machine at uh, on the campus may be difficult uh, versus Johns Hopkins Hospital, just with huge patient volume and its world-class reputation, you get latest machine from Siemens and G and all those. So there are certain uh, disparities. We have used the word before. Um, and therefore, I think you have to work with your disparity. Some of the things are great equalizers, right? So synthesizing nanoparticles, little microchips, I mean, some of these are actually, you know, mobile phone and these technologies. Uh, th these are all great equalizers, you know. So, so in that sense, work with the equalizer. The second part is, which I, like, makes me envious, is the brain trust that you generally have access to. You know, your students are kind of paid for. They come on fellowship. Um, there's a increasing privilege and attention to um, uh, research. Well, your difficulty being at Johns Hopkins, clinical interaction access comes more easily to me, and you have to go all the way to TIFR, Tata, or wherever one of the private hospitals and such. So I, 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 I think smart and alert people will create the local optimization. You know, we could always be wishful. I could have been, could might have been. I mean, there's a generic answer, collaborations. I mean, that's uh, easier said than done, but this is what is impressive are the proposals that came out within relatively short notice that at least people pitched a bunch of collaborations. So that kind of starts solving some of the problem. Uh, you, you know, you, if you are really good, IIT Bombay Heritage Fund, and if you have a consensus high impact quality pitch, I think there are some alumni who must donate they tend to donate a building because they can put a name on it, but some might donate a machine, you know, right? To something if that's a privileged necessity, if that can be communicated and articulated very well, right? I mean, if IIT Kanpur is going to get the entire medical school with massive amount of fund infusion, we are talking about something different scale. But otherwise, yes, there is a certain specialty shifting of priority and your self-optimization that's going to occur because those kind of people will come on campus knowing that they can still work in the ecosystem. My impression of our decades of interaction is how do you, I think that's a non-issue. The issue is how do you keep that fires burning? You know, like young faculty to senior, how do you keep the fires burning and not of course drown senior people into bureaucracy and admin and junior faculty with 
drowning them in teaching. You guys, you should start thinking about that internal efficiencies of human efficiencies. The other things, building, air conditioner, nanoparticle, MRI machine, I mean, they are there, but there's a certain, you know, I wish glass half full notion to it. So, you know, my mind is looking at the university, having dealt with directors, our faculty alumni network is seeing something different than you are seeing. I see you all very buried in processes, whether you have to teach a lot or grade or paperwork or purchasing as a nonsense, grants come too late. I remember when bioengineering the equipment took forever, then sat in the hallway because the building wasn't there and all that kind of, those are internal inefficiency that institute can solve, right? Before worrying about what is not. And other is, you know, tapping your tremendous manpower, um, which is both students and now the faculty who are significantly research minded than my era, right? So I, I'm inclined to shift focus on something else. But your question, I, I empathize. Hey, you know, I sit here and I think, I've never seen a director coming and telling, I mean, okay, be, I have to be careful. I said, well, we are sort of, sort of money or government support. I mean, yes, you always are. But amount of brutal competitiveness on grant and funding that we see in US and elsewhere, you don't have to. I have to fund every one of my students, right? So glass half full, half empty is everywhere. Uh, you know, find your optimization, you know, and reduce your um, bureaucracy. I'm sure US faculty realize the nonstop bureaucratic paperwork, email, grading, teaching, purchasing committees drown you out. I. I bring 80, 90% of my salary through grants. I have hard, any distractions are self-brought. I bring it upon myself because I want to do this and I want to edit and I want to run this and I want to be curiosity wise, I'm in a committee. So I think if you could, uh, but I pay high price in terms of, I'm like my age, I'm more productive and more energetic than my youth. So keep the fires burning for all of you, you know, and reduce the efficiencies. Uh, I mean, improve the efficiencies. So focus on that is what my, this, you know, distant view about it is. I'm sure, and I know, I know, I'm sure I think talk, unlike many of your donors and alumni who don't understand the life of a faculty, I know how that is. So I, I, I want to pitch on that side of it to how to improve the life of a faculty so that they have that fires burning for a, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think you have you have hit the uh, hit the nerve. So we'll probably have a bit more discussion on it uh, internally. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Dr. Mitesh. Any uh, any other question before we close? I think they're waiting for a validatory closing session. Okay. Uh, uh, so Professor Mitesh, could you also join? I will stay on. Uh, I don't know how the joining works, but thank you okay. all for the invitation. Let's go. Let's stay on schedule. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Nitish Thakur, for uh, a very interesting talk. Um, uh, we, we all really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks. I have Thanks pasted second. the validatory section uh, session link in the chat box. I think Please also Nitish is not able to view the chat, is it? Uh, okay, I will share him an email. Everybody can see the chat. Yeah, I think I have it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that link you can. Otherwise, click. I will send him an email. Yeah. Thank you, Hevel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor Pramod. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ganesh.